the show that reveals how extraordinary items in our world are designed, constructed and produced. See the engineering, the technology and big ideas that make the world go round. Find out how it works. Storing this pongy product isn't easy, but we'll find out how one famous plastics company came up with an inventive solution. The future is here. Laser technology is now in most British homes, but we'll show you how a DVD is produced from start to finish. And it's been the favorite beverage of boozers for thousands of years. We reveal the magic that goes into the manufacture of a crisp, cool lager. But first, the common steel spring. This spring is important because it's part of a luxury handmade leather bicycle saddle, which has been keeping cyclists behind comfortable for more than 140 years. These luxury saddles are made by a company called Brooks here in the UK. Although times have moved on, they still make some of their original designs that are over 100 years old. The first thing that goes into this signature seat is the frame. The design is so good that in the 1920s, most Tour de France competitors used these high-quality saddles. Times have moved on at the competitive level, but the construction process remains the same. The counters that keep track of what's being used are clockwork. There's no laser-guided computer to malfunction here, and the quality control is also performed the old-fashioned way. Keeping with tradition, these handmade saddles shun the modern substances like plastic. Instead, the manufacturers use traditional leather for the seat. However, unlike modern malleable plastics which can be turned into any shape very easily, leather is very stiff in its original form. To get it into a more manageable state, the workers will bathe these pre-cut seat templates in plain water for two hours. This will help soften the material ready for the next stage. With the sharpened blade, the worker can now shape the leather seat precisely. Whilst the press holds it in the right form, he can cut away the extra material from around the edges. What emerges already looks like a bicycle saddle, but it wouldn't give you much support like this. Heating wet leather can damage it, but not here. The saddles are now cooked for two hours at 50 degrees Celsius, which helps strengthen the fibers in the material. With modern production methods being readily available and far cheaper, you may be wondering why anyone would want a tough old leather seat instead of a comfy rubber one. Well, it may surprise you to learn that this ancient seat design is actually better for you than modern rubber seats. Tested in laboratory conditions, the modern saddle was compared to the handmade leather variety. Sensors on the modern saddle reveal red areas. This shows excessive pressure which can lead to tissue damage in the long run. When the same equipment was tried on the 140-year-old design, the results were unexpected. The old-fashioned shape seemed to support the rider far better. This would mean a far more comfortable ride. Perhaps moving with the times isn't always for the best. The innovative British design is popular because it seems to work better, but there are also modern trends to consider. Retro styling is becoming more fashionable again. So, with the saddles in the right shape, they now need to be given some reinforcement. Rivets and the pre-made steel attachments are added to the leather seat. Without them, there would be no way to join the seat to the framework. The 
seat support is divided into two parts. The springs at the back of the saddle will provide suspension, acting like shock absorbers would on the car. This will make the cyclist's ride much more comfortable. The framework attached to the front of the seat provides support, balance and strength to help it survive plenty of use. Staff here are particularly proud of one customer's story. Apparently he's had the same saddle on his bike that he bought over 60 years ago and it's as comfortable now as the day he bought it. Fitting all the components together is another part of the handmade process that gives these saddles their famous quality. Each specific part is adjusted by hand to ensure that it's properly assembled. The attention to detail that comes with a bespoke saddle goes a long way to ensuring customer satisfaction. This is particularly important when assembling the front of the seat. Customers expect expensive products to last, so helpful little tools have been incorporated into the saddle's design. Included in the front section is an adjustable nut. As the leather wears over time, it stretches, and this nut can be used to tighten it back up once more. The bespoke leather saddle is nearly complete. It can take up to 90 days of hard labor to reach this point, so it's no surprise that these saddles can cost as much as 200 pounds. A final buffing with some high quality wax improves the final appearance, and they're ready to go. This traditional design helps put the spring back into your Sunday afternoon cycle ride. The Tupperware Party the first one in the UK was in 1960 and it started a tidal wave of copycat coffee mornings around the country. Tupperware was the technological miracle set to revolutionise kitchen storage. But even that miracle product struggles when trying to store smelly cheese. Design teams today have a lot of inspiration to draw on. Originating in the US over 60 years ago, Tupperware has developed a long way since its invention. Modern computer graphics play a big part in coming up with and refining any new designs. Unlike old models which were simply containers for any product, Tupperware today is designed with very specific end uses in mind. To store that soft ripe camembert for example, the designers have to consider many issues. The first is the appearance. Cheese wheels have curves, so the designers will try and emulate that in the box. This will associate the box with its intended purpose when it's being sold in the stores. Tupperware is made from a high-quality granulated plastic that can be used with food products. The plastic grains are pumped into a machine which will heat them up to melting point. Once they're liquid, the high pressure will force the molten plastic into the mold to create the new cheese box. Inside each machine is a template for the new lid or the base of the cheese box. When the machine is closed up and is sealed, the pressure inside forces the liquid plastic into the empty space. When the plastic solidifies, it can be removed from the machine ready to cope with a fresh camembert or some ripe gorgonzola. The bases are made in a similar way using a different coloured plastic depending on the designer's plans. Now you may have noticed that there's an enormous hole in the top of the lid still. When storing cheese there are two big problems. One is the condensation. As the cheese cools it releases moisture which condenses inside your container. This isn't good. The designers have tried a variety of different techniques, including nappy material to allow the moisture to be released. 
but the real problem is not just letting the moisture out, but also keeping the cheese smell in. The innovative design they eventually came up with for this box is a membrane which allows the smaller water molecules to escape whilst trapping the larger cheesy smelling odour molecules inside. So back at the production plants we can see this being made, but it's not injection moulded in the same way as the lid and vase. Pre-cut pieces of membrane are placed into the moulds and the plastic is sprayed onto it where the two parts combine to create the finished filter. The final part of the production process is testing. Tupperware is made of plastic and as we have seen it can be manipulated through heat. However, once an airtight design is made, the manufacturers don't want it to change shape anymore. The one place your Tupperware containers will get hot is the dishwasher. So in the testing lab, the staff wash a sample from each batch several times to make sure it won't get warped in the wash. Any change in shape and the cheesy smell would escape no matter how well designed the odour filter was. Once everyone is certain that the design works, the whole unit can be assembled and then sent out to Tupperware parties all over the world. With its clever membrane which allows condensation to escape but not the fresh odour of ripe smelly camembert, you can see why the party is still going strong for this long-standing kitchen storage product. Still to come. Whether it's a Hollywood classic or your favorite music video, there's more to this high-tech storage system than meets the eye. We'll show you how a DVD is put together. And what have barley, bottles, a bath and brushes all got in common? You'll find the answer at the bottom of the glass and in part two after the break. Ever since their introduction to Europe in 1998, DVDs have taken the home movie world by storm. They replaced old spools of a VHS tape with glittering laser beams of light chock full of information. Production begins in an edit suite. This is where the director will cut the show or the movie that we all want to watch. The final program can then be stored either onto a tape or a computer hard drive which can then be taken on to the DVD factory. Now although they're usually shiny, metallic and reflective, a DVD actually starts life as a disc of clear glass. This is coated with a very thin layer of photosensitive material so that information can be stored onto it. The freshly painted disc is then put into the laser machine. This is where the blockbuster movie can be written or etched onto the surface of the glass. The laser cuts billions of tiny notches into the light sensitive layer that's been painted on. With the information in place, the glass disc now needs to be turned into a DVD template. The glass master is washed in a nickel bath for an hour and the nickel collects in the notches. These notches carry all of the information, in this case our movie, to form the Glass Master. This is a DVD template and thousands of copies of the film or music video can be printed from it. Before printing, the template now needs to be cut down to size, otherwise it won't fit into the printing press. 
When it's ready, it's fitted into the machine and brand new DVDs can be produced. It has to be done carefully though, as this is the only copy that exists. The printing press is filled with the raw material which is a form of plastic called polycarbonate. This is melted and forced against the surface of the negative. A new DVD is pressed like this every three seconds. Now, you may have spotted that these new discs are completely clear, which is a problem. A DVD player can't read them like this, so now they receive a coat of aluminium. This is then followed by another clear plastic disc. This will protect the aluminium layer and the all-important information in case you ever drop the disc. The next machine sprays a fine layer of clear glue between the two to bond them together. This is then followed up by a trip under the UV light. This hardens the glue permanently and stops them coming apart. To get a picture of this shiny disc, your DVD player shoots a laser beam at it. This beam would pass through a clear disc, but now it's reflected back off the aluminium layer. The laser beam bounces back onto a receiver and is translated into pictures and sound on your TV. Now you have to identify the disc, so first the machine checks which discs it's working on using an infrared device. They're sent to receive a layer of white paint. Next, the colours are applied to the rollers, which spread it evenly and transfer it to each disc as it passes underneath. A quality control inspector keeps a close eye on the final discs that emerge. If you were looking forward to an action-adventure and happened to find a romantic comedy, you'd probably be disappointed, so it's important to make sure the right discs get into the right box. So what started out as an ordinary glass disc has been turned into an ingenious, wafer-thin copy of the latest Hollywood blockbuster on DVD. For a classy night out, you probably reach for the cocktails. But historically speaking, the English often prefer beer. Invented by the Mesopotamians, it's a firm favourite to this day. A particular favourite is German beer, famous for its purity and taste. They even have a dedicated law called the Purity Law. Only natural products are allowed in the brewing process. The grain used to make lager is called barley. It's collected every year by enormous combine harvesters which separate the stalks from the grain. At the brewery, the barley is mixed with warm water. It's about 15 degrees Celsius and this is the beginning of a process called germination. As it sits in the enormous copper tanks, the barley absorbs the warm water which triggers a reaction in the seeds vital to the brewing process. The barley actually starts to grow. This growth spurt starts the production of malt in the grains, which is needed to make beer with. After about six days, the barley is dried and rotated to stop it from rotting, and the brewer is left with what looks like muesli. This is malted barley. And for all you beer fans out there, this is where the brewing process starts. The malted barley is mixed with fresh, clean water. Here, the malt that was produced during germination can now get to work on the natural starches in the barley itself. The complex sugars or starch needs to be broken down. This green character represents the enzyme that does the job. The enzyme's interaction with the starch breaks the chain, producing sugar. This is what you make alcohol from. 
2002, Britons consumed almost 10.5 billion pints, so the brewers have a lot of work to do. Once the malt has done its job and broken down all the starch, the mixture is passed on to the next tank. Now, if the barman in your local served you a pint of this, you'd probably ask for a fresh glass. The mixture still has all of the malted barley powder and husks in it, so the next step is to get rid of it. At the bottom of this tank is a sieve and the liquid flows out, leaving the malt inside. It's sold to farmers as it makes excellent feed for cattle. Now that all of the fibre and husks have been removed, the clear liquid is sent to a different tank where the brewer adds the next ingredient, the hops. Hops will give the beer its characteristic bitter flavour. The more hops used, the more bitter the final taste. The last ingredient is probably the most important one for beer, yeast. This is responsible for the two most obvious characteristics of lager. Firstly, bubbles. The yeast ferments which releases gas and this makes the beer frothy. At first there are too many bubbles and all you get is a glass of foam. However, the beer is left to brew in the tanks at just 2 degrees Celsius for about 4 weeks. This gives it time to develop flavour and for the yeast to ferment the sugar into alcohol, the second important characteristic. One of the perks of being the boss is that you get to sample some of each new brew that emerges. It seems to go down quite well. All that remains is to get the beer to the pubs so you can have a pint. Reusable bottles arrive at the plant by their thousands, but they need to be cleaned and checked to make sure they're safe. This machine shines a light through the freshly washed bottles and any with defects are sent to the recycling bin. The plant can fill 50,000 bottles every hour, which are then capped with a fresh lid. The bottles are then passed through water so that the brand new labels will stick when they're applied. And finally, they're packed into cases and loaded up to be shipped out to the pubs, bars and supermarkets all over Germany and beyond. German industry is renowned for producing precision engineering. Unfortunately for those who like a tipple, that attention to detail even includes their lager.